Thank you for joining us this week on The Tongue with Dr. Mike. I'm so glad you're back with us again. As always, make sure to visit the website, thetonguespeakslife.com, where you can listen to all those podcasts over the last couple of weeks. Of course, if you want access to our full catalog of topics from before, from The Tongue with Dr. Mike and Pillars of Heaven, make sure you're heading over to psalm346ministries.org, or if that's too long for you, just simply type in p346.org. And I know you're on Facebook. And if you're on Facebook and you haven't gone to Psalm 34, 6 Ministries yet, get over to that group. Get over there and get involved. Um, Become a member of that group. There's daily encouragement there from a bunch of us. Questions, comments, prayer requests, it's all there. Make sure you're you're checking that out. Remember, the tonguespeakslife.com or Psalm346ministries.org. Of course, if you want a nice hot cup of coffee, you can go to p346.shop, order coffee, have it sent out to you. Same thing, there's a little bit of merchandise there right now, some hats and some shirts and some sweatshirts. Head on over and check that out. Cure International is on the website. Uh, Cure, man, if you haven't checked out Cure and and if you have children especially and, and children hit home with you, Man, check out Cure International. There's a there's a link right there on the tonguespeakslife.com. It will soon be on P346 Ministries. You can donate right to them, and they are changing the lives of children, and it is important that you check that out. Um, donations. We always talk about donations. We still need people's time. We need their talents. Uh, if it's on your heart to give money, you can also... Um, donate right to the tonguespeakslife.com. You can donate to Psalm 346 Ministries. All goes to the same place. If you need a Bible, it goes to help support that. Uh, our food drive, it's all supported through that. So if that's on your heart, take a second and head on over there. But if you do need a Bible, man, reach out immediately or go to p346.shop and put one in your shopping cart for free and check out and we'll get that out to you. So as our family keeps growing, I want to say welcome back to everybody. God bless you wherever you're listening uh, to this. And it is growing, man. It is growing fast. So thank you, God, for the wide reach this program is making and continue to use us in reaching further than we could ever imagine. And we are rolling right along. And today's topic is about anointing with oil. So here we go. Psalm 23, 5. Simple. You anoint my head with oil. Over 100 years ago, William Evans wrote a little book about Psalm 23, and in there he said, a shepherd must needs be a physician also. In the belt of the shepherd, medicines are always carried. Sheep are very susceptible to sickness of many kinds. Oftentimes at night as the sheep passed into the fold of the shepherd's knowing eye, uh, he would detect that one or another of them was sick or feverish, and he would take the feverish sheep and anoint that bruise with mollifying ointment. Right, so olive oil was the shepherd's great secret. They used it for making and dipping their bread in it. They used it for fuel for their lamp. They used it as a lotion. They used it as an ointment for their own wounds and those of the sheep. A few drops of that lubricating fluid would relieve the, the hurt of a cut or a bruise. And the Bible compares the Holy Spirit to oil. The good shepherd anoints us with this precious oil and and the spirit's invisible ministry. uh, It gives us nourishment and it becomes a radiance to our face like a lotion and it heals our wounds. The metaphor for oil, the visible and tangible liquid poured upon and absorbed by a human being. It tells the invisible presence and actions of the Holy Spirit. So why is anointing oil important in the Bible? Frequently, um, Let's, let's start in the Old Testament, especially in the Old Testament. We see anointing of oil as an important practice in the Bible, right? It's one of the most quoted chapters of Scripture, Psalm 23, including that phrase, you anoint my head with oil. Certain symbolic elements in the Bible have become lost in our culture today because we no longer have the same customs or practices. So why does pouring oil over someone's head have a symbolic importance in the Old Testament? And do we see that practice in other ancient cultures? And why does that matter for us today? Old Testament, it seems, you know, first glance, the Old Testament, olive oil was, or anointing oil, was predominantly a religious purpose. 
Not only would you pour oil on the head of a high priest, but also this this holy oil would sprinkle on furnishings in the tabernacle. Um, you can read about that Exodus 20, Exodus twenty five. You know. Um, until they created a permanent place of worship during the, the time of Solomon. That was a transportable temple that they sprinkled uh, on the furnishings. Olive oil was used, you know, during uh, not just that, but the beautification process. Uh, you can read about that in Esther, Esther chapter two, check that out. You know, over several months, Esther, along with other eligible ladies, they would cleanse themselves with myrrh and oil, but for six months, and then another six months with perfume and cosmetics. You know, oil often signifying prosperity or blessing or stability, you know, opposed to other periods throughout Israel's history where the harvest was not bountiful and famine swept the land. Oil had sanctifying or, or cleansing properties. Whenever someone poured oil on, on someone or something, they had set apart that object as a blessed object of the Lord. Therefore, that explains the reasons why throughout the Old Testament, they would anoint both people and inanimate objects. Israel commonly practiced anointing the heads of kings. That's why Samuel chooses to anoint uh, the lowliest of Jesse's sons, young David. And for Samuel, um, that would have surprised, it, it wouldn't have surprised the family. You know, they didn't think, oh, I guess he's giving David's head a nice oil bath. They would have understood the implications of Samuel's actions, right? God has chosen the next king of Israel, Jesse's youngest son. But the practice of anointing with oil transfers over to the New Testament also. Jesus encourages his followers to anoint themselves with oil whenever they take up the practice of fasting and to pour oil on the sick as part of the healing process. You can read that in Matthew, read that in Mark. The practice of anointing with oil doesn't appear to, to, to stretch much beyond the Gospels, uh, which makes a little bit of, you know, a couple of the Christians wonder if believers still use that practice today. I mean, should we still anoint with oil? So there's reasons why a Christian can still use that practice. But believers should keep in mind that everyone, not everyone, holds that, that same viewpoint. Some people do, some people don't. It's important to ask your pastors their, their position on that practice and then read the scriptures concerning that practice and then exercise discernment. No matter what your position is on, that, on the practice of anointing with oil, be sure to listen to those with opposing viewpoints and, and be gentle and, and respect. Respect those, those viewpoints. You should note that oil was uh, symbolic beyond anointing just in the Bible. The Israelis used oil for, uh, for several purposes throughout the Old and New Testament. You know, they'd use oil to light their lamps or they'd use it for lotion for skin and hair, you know, and they recognized that it had medicinal properties. And, and that oil, the, the symbolism was linked to the Holy Spirit's presence. When a person's anointed in the Bible, the Holy Spirit descends upon that person. Therefore, when Jesus is called anointed, the Bible means by the Holy Spirit. In essence, when somebody consecrates and sanctifies something with oil, they set it apart for God's use. Other uses of, of oil included, uh, man, anything from anointing corpses and refreshing bodies, you know, throughout all of biblical history. You can't even read Homer's Iliad or Odyssey without finding the practice of anointing the head of a guest with oil, right? And, and typical of the Dark Age Greek culture, uh, part of hospitality ensured giving guests a bath or anointing their heads with oil, providing them with fresh clothes, a meal, and a place to stay for the night. You know, the Greek Dark Ages, I'm talking about that time from 1200 to 800 BC, around the same time of David and, and the other kings of Israel, you know, and that information checks out that, you know, the practice of oil being used in the Old Testament and by other nations. But what did anointing mean? Certainly it didn't have as many religious connotations, did it? I mean, the Israelites seem to use oil for commonplace purposes like other nations. You can read that in Ruth. You know, we can assume surrounding nations during Old Testament times used oil for cleansing and medicinal properties as well. You can see the use of oil for commonplace and religious purposes all through ancient Egypt, Australia, Greece, uh, all throughout the Middle Ages. You know, but, but why does anointing matter today? 
Whether we believe Christians should still practice the anointing of oil, uh, that subject matter is is touchy for a number of reasons. You know, God used an important cultural symbol and practice to foreshadow the work of the Holy Spirit. Although the Israeli um, or the Israeli the Israeli um, Israeli lights, let's say, consecrated priests and holy objects, they set them apart for God's work. We talked about that, uh, but that was just the beginning. The Holy Spirit consecrates uh, consecrates saints, right? He anoints them. He sets them apart to do the work of God. You can see that uh, God's provision at work through the multiple uses of oil. In the same way, we can picture how God can use it in multiple ways. Sometimes he'll ordain ordinary tasks, such as day-to-day tasks in the workplace. In other instances, he'll give us spiritual gifts to use to encourage other believers and present a light to unbelievers. We see the importance of oil through the word anointed and its associations with Jesus. Anointing oil was used on priests and kings for important purposes. In the same way, Jesus is our high priest and our king. This practice used in Israel and throughout the ancient world foreshadowed God's work through his son. What's the anointing of the Holy Spirit, right? The Bible speaks of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but what does that mean? Who's been anointed with the Spirit? So the Bible has this to say about it. John said that all believers have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle John told his readers that they had been anointed with the Holy Spirit, and he explained it in this way, 1 John chapter 2. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. But the anointing that you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and it is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Those who have believed in Jesus Christ have received this anointing. Paul refers to the anointing of the Holy Spirit also. Um, The only other reference in the New Testament to the anointing of the Spirit for the believer is found in the writings of the Apostle Paul. And he wrote the following to the Corinthians, right? 2 Corinthians 1, 21. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. Paul wrote that each believer had received the anointing of the Spirit, Jesus himself was anointed with the Holy Spirit. We also find that Jesus was anointed when he became uh, or when he began his public ministry. Jesus read a passage from Isaiah. Uh, You can read this in Luke chapter four. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free. Jesus claimed that that this prediction was fulfilled by him. Luke records him doing uh, the following after reading this passage, right? Luke 4 again, um, verse 20. Let's go to that. That says, Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The anointed of the Spirit was upon Jesus, right? Furthermore, this anointing was upon him during his entire earthly ministry. Later, Peter would tell the people about Jesus' anointing. He explained it this way in Acts chapter 10. It says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed uh, by the devil, for God was with him. In this context, the anointing of Jesus was for the work of the ministry, Right, so the, the meaning of that anointing, you know, what, what is anointing? Right, some see the anointing of the Spirit as another way of saying uh, the believer has already received the Holy Spirit, while others think it's a special ministry that the Spirit of God has in the life of each person. Well, each believer, anyway. Observations about the anointing of the Holy Spirit, uh, and we're going to get into some verses here. You can observe the following about the anointing of the Spirit. God does the anointing. Right, it, it's God who anoints the believer with His Holy Spirit. We don't anoint ourselves. This is entirely a work of God. The anointing remains forever. This anointing of the Holy Spirit remains forever with the believer. It never leaves those who receive it. 
The purpose of that anointing is to teach us. The purpose of that, uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is that the believer might be taught of God. He anoints us to teach us his truth so that he can, we can please him by doing the work of the ministry. He helps in understanding the word of God. Right, We find that the Holy Spirit anoints the believer in spiritual discernment and the understanding of the Word of God. In fact, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would be the teacher of those who believed in him. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus said, but, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance of all that I have said to you. That's John chapter 14. Check that out. The Holy Spirit was promised to teach Jesus uh, his disciples as well as to bring back all of his words to their remembrance. Jesus also said the Spirit, as their teacher, would guide them into all truth. He also gave his disciples this promise in John chapter 16. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So, the anointing of the Spirit teaches us the truths of God. People may become anointed with a special ministry. Uh, this has been argue, uh, argued and, and talked about and debated, but, but, but in the, like in the case of Jesus, the Holy Spirit may indeed anoint certain people to do a particular ministry. In other words, they've been given certain abilities to perform God's work in a unique way. You can properly speak of that person, that person as having been anointed of the Spirit to perform that task. Again, that's something which God alone does. We don't anoint ourselves for that ministry. So the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is another provision that God gives to us so that, he can, that, that we can better serve him. So what does the Bible say about oil as a symbol of God's Holy Spirit? Right there, there's ten roles of the Holy Spirit. Uh, well, th there's a lot, but here, here's ten of them. Right, the, the, these are ten ways that the Holy Spirit works in the lives of believers. He's a helper who teaches and reminds. In John 14, Jesus told his disciples, "The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all these things and bring to you the remembrance of all I've said to you." Right, I could tell you some Greek words there that that translate it into. Um, the helper or advocate or counselor, you know, um, it, it sort of alludes to legal counsel. The Holy Spirit provides wise counsel to Christ's followers. Jesus knew he'd be going away and that his followers would need the Holy Spirit as a helper and an advocate to remind them of his teachings. It also convicts the world of sin. In addition to providing wise counsel, attorneys also provide evidence used to convict criminals, right? So in a similar fashion, the Holy Spirit will prove the sin, righteousness, and judgment of the world. John 16 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and the righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit dwells in believers and fills us. The Holy Spirit is God's presence in the lives of believers. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? The Holy Spirit's a source of revelation and wisdom and power. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except for their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. That's in 1 uh, Corinthians 2.10. God gives his followers the Holy Spirit so we may know him better. Since the Holy Spirit is God's spirit, it knows the thoughts of God and reveals those thoughts to believers. The Holy Spirit opens believers' eyes to the hope of salvation and their inheritance in Christ. Jesus knew that his disciples would need uh, the power to carry out their mission to be witnesses to the entire world. Jesus told his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 1. 
Christians, the Christians have access to, to power and, and revelation and wisdom from the Holy Spirit, just as the Apostle Paul wrote to, uh, to, to the Ephesians, right? In Ephesians 1, he said, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope in which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. That was Ephesians 1, 17 through 20. The Holy Spirit guides to all truth and knowledge of what's to come. Right, The Holy Spirit tells what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. In John 16, 13, uh, he's called the Spirit of Truth because he guides believers into all truth. Jesus told his disciples the Holy Spirit would make known what he hears and would only speak what the Father speaks. Let's go over that again. That's John 16. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the father is mine. That's why I said the spirit will receive from me and he will make known to you. The Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts to believers. And this is something we could talk about for a couple series. And, and, and we touched on it briefly way back in a couple seasons ago. Um, but the attributes of the Holy Spirit, and, and we know them, you know, wisdom and knowledge and power, they're all ma- manifested in the lives of believers for the good of others. You know, uh, the rest of the gifts are, are listed in First Corinthians. You could read that in chapter 12. But it's also a seal in the lives of believers. You know, in ancient times, a seal was a a legal signature, attesting ownership and validating what was sealed, right? So the Holy Spirit's our mark of adoption as God's children. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to his followers so that they could be confident in their salvation. Just as you might make a deposit or a down payment on a new car to make sure the salesperson doesn't sell it to anyone else, the Holy Spirit is a deposit in our lives conforming, uh, I'm sorry, confirming uh, the validity of Christ's message and, and that we belong to Christ. Let's go to Ephesians chapter one. Verse 13, it says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit helps in our weakness and he intercedes for us. We all have times when we feel weak and we don't know what to do. The Holy Spirit helps us align with God's will by interceding for us during those times. Romans chapter 8 says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Holy Spirit makes believers new and grants us eternal life. Holy Spirit works in the lives of believers to renew and to sanctify and to make us holy. Just as the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead, the Holy Spirit will give eternal life to believers in Christ. Back to Romans 8, verse 10. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life, gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Christ, Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. The Holy Spirit sanctifies and enables good fruit in our lives as well. The work of the Holy Spirit in a Christian life is an ongoing process of becoming holy through sanctification, right? Through the conviction and the power of the Holy Spirit, believers who, who, uh, who don't indulge the sinful acts of the flesh, uh, but they bear the good fruit of the Spirit. And you can read about that in Galatians 5. 
Bible's filled with verses about the Holy Spirit, right? Acts, Romans, let's go to Acts chapter four. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Romans chapter eight says, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Second Thessalonians 2 says, God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the spirit and through belief in the truth. Titus 3 says he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Okay, so let's talk about things that destroy our anointing. Let's talk about fear. We talk about fear a lot on this show. We talk about fear on Pillars of Heaven. Uh, Fear is the devil's anointing. Right, Make no mistake about it. The enemy is going to continuously try to bring fear into your mental thought process. Have you ever known anyone who was a prisoner of war? Right, Some brave men were taken captive by the enemy and endured the horrors of being a prisoner of war. Those men will tell you that the enemy creates an environment for brainwashing. The enemy tries to break down their resistance by feeding them a constant diet of hopelessness and fear. The enemy controls the interrogation process with just one objective, break the captive's will to live so they will abandon their sense of right and wrong. The devil would like nothing better than to make you a mental prisoner of war. He tries to create an atmosphere of panic and uncertainty. Then he'll bring negative thoughts to your mind, trying to make you think that you have no way of escape. He wants to replace your faith with fear, your determination with doubt your past with his future for you. The enemy of your success, your anointing, wants fear in your life. And he understands that you were born with two fears, falling and loud noises. That's it. All other fears are acquired. Often deeply embedded within us, fear results from past failure, from a lack of confidence uh, bred unknowingly by our parents or our relatives. And it's enforced by society's general negative, short-sighted thinking. Your loving Heavenly Father understands the strategies of the enemy. He knows that if the enemy has you living in fear, that he can destroy the anointing in your life. God wants us to understand that, uh, to understand that fear is not from him. Okay, so here's a question. How many times does God have to tell us something for us to believe it? Once should be enough, right? Would it be fair to say that if God wants you to really get something, that he'll say it more than once? In the King James Version of the Bible, we're told nine times that we should be born again. So I think it's fair to say that being born again is significant and obviously important to God. After all, he paid the ultimate price by sending his only begotten son, and we should not perish but have everlasting and abundant life by being born again. So would it surprise you to know that in the King James Version of the Bible, we're told 63 times to fear not. Let's look at some of those, right? First, God wants us to eliminate all fear of failure. In Joshua 8, it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee and arise, go up. Secondly, God wants us to know that he's our salvation. So we have no reason to be fearful or afraid. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear or dread? The Lord is the refuge and stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Number three, God doesn't want us to be worried or feel fearful about what may happen tomorrow. Right? Romans 8.32 says, neither death nor life, nor angels or demons, Neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Are you seeing this? Neither the fears for today or our worries about tomorrow can keep his love from you, his promises from you, or his anointing for you from manifesting in your life because he's faithful to perform all that he's promised you if you receive them. 
I think it's also important to get Matthew 634 in there where it says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come when the time comes. Let's keep going. Number four, God's your helper. So there's no need to fear. Hebrews 13, five and six. So, so we take comfort and are encouraged and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread nor be terrified. What can man do to me? Number five, fear will flee when God takes you by the hand. Where's that? Isaiah 41. Don't panic. I'm with you. There's no need to fear for I'm your God. I'll give you strength. I'll help you. I'll hold you steady. Keep a firm grip on you. Number six, God's fighting against your enemies with you, so you have no reason to fear. Jump back to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Verse one says, in a few minutes, you're going to do battle with your enemies. Don't waver and resolve. Don't fear. Don't hesitate. Don't panic. God, your God, is right there with you, fighting with you against your enemies, fighting to win. Exodus 23, 22 says, but if you will indeed listen and obey his voice, I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your or an adversary to your adversaries. Romans 8:31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be our foe if God is on our side? Psalm 118 says, God now at my side, and I'm not afraid. He's now at my side, and I'm not afraid. Who would dare lay a hand on me? Hebrews 13, 6. So we take comfort and are encouraged and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do to me? I put that in there twice. Let's keep going. One more. You have no reason to be afraid because of the anointing that's living with you. You have the Holy Spirit teaching, teaching you how to manifest the anointing in your daily life. Right, John 14, 26 says, but the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the intercessor, the advocate, the strengthener, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name or in my place uh, to represent me or act on my behalf, he will teach you all things and he will cause you to recall or will remind you of or bring to your remembrance everything I've told you. Peace I leave you. My peace I now give and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives it do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So that means stop allowing yourself to be agitated and disturbed, and do not permit yourself to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. God not only teaches you, but he's embedded Christ's anointing deeply within you. 1 John chapter 2, verse 26. I've, I've written to warn you about those who are trying to deceive you, but they're no match for what's embedded deep within you, Christ's anointing, no less. You don't need any of their so-called teaching. Christ's anointing teaches you the truth on everything you need to know about yourself and him, uncontaminated by a single lie, live deeply in what you were taught. I, I hope you fully comprehend what that scripture's saying. You have the anointing of Christ deep inside you. The, the, the verse also says, live deeply in what you were taught. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words about being anointed. I mean, hopefully we have a better understanding of why this was, this was used and what it was used for. Yet, yeah, thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit. I pray for an outpouring of anointing on your children's heads as they yearn for power and strength and abilities to conquer all obstacles and all giants in their lives over all fear, over all discouragement. I pray for those who have not felt the power of the Holy Spirit move in their life. And I pray that you show them, me included, a better and more in-depth understanding and knowledge of who the Holy Spirit is. Let them gain discernment while reading the scriptures. Let them get to know the presence of the Holy Spirit and and I pray it moves on all your sons and daughters as it pours over their lives and over this ministry to eliminate all the fears left behind from our old selves. I pray that in Jesus' name. Listen, we say this all the time here. The words near you, it's in your mouth and it's in your heart. 
And, and that's the message that we declare, right? If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's it. That's how simple this is. This is a total free gift. There's nothing you can do that we have done to earn this. You can't earn your way into heaven. This is a gift so that nobody can boast. It, it is free for you. All you have to do is accept it. Right, And in this time of panic and in this time of uncertainty in this world and in this time where fear is taking over, you need to know that you don't need to waste another minute, uh, another minute of your life in worry or fear or discouragement or being down or, or, or not knowing where to turn. Right, This life is quick and it's over. And our decisions today carry an eternal consequence. You don't want to say, I, I wish I, I, I thought about this more, or I wish, I wish I had one more day to think about this. Jesus is waiting for you. He came to the earth and was born to die so that he could take your punishment. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't do this alone. I believe that, that you are the son of God and you took the penalty of my sin and you died for me. And on the third day, you rose to glory and you're coming back. Jesus, I'm going to see you soon. Come into my life and accept you. I, I accept you into my heart. Forgive my sins. Become the leader in my life. I turn everything over to you. Right, it's that simple. It's that easy. Right? Being born again. We're told that there's no name anywhere by which man will be saved except through Jesus Christ. And at one, at one time, we're all, every knee will bow. And, and you will accept the lordship of Jesus Christ. And you want to know who he is. You want to know who, who he is, right? You want, you want to start that journey. That book, that, that free book that we're offering, this Bible, you need one. You, you come get one. You, you tell us that you need a Bible. But that's the owner's manual for life. There's answers in there that, that tell you and show you how you don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live. You're a victor. You, you, and listen, because people say this all the time, you're not going to get, this isn't a life free of worry and, and free of, of problems. It is free of worry. It's not free of problems. You're going to have problems, but you don't get victory without battles, right? And, and, and the difference is you're going to face these things anyway, but you have somebody that conquers this for you. And there's a way out and you, you can get through this and people will start to look to you and they'll say, how did you do that? And that's where your testimony comes through. I didn't do it. I'm a failure. I couldn't do it. I'll tell you right now, I'm the biggest failure here. I failed everything I've tried in this life. Everything. Everything. And it brought me to where I am now. And I can tell right now, the only victory I have in this life is through Jesus Christ. And he's coming back again. And I want all my friends and my family to know who he is. So I want them all to come to heaven. I want, I want, I want us all to go there in a big party bus. And, and I, I want us all there. Right? And I want to bring as many as I can with me. So God, God is listening. He's, he, you, don't have to, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to make yourself better. You don't have to go do anything for, for Jesus to meet you right here. This poor man called out and the Lord heard him. And he saved him out of all his troubles. Right. God bless you and your decisions and be prepared for wonderful things in ways that you might not even see coming in Jesus name, all victories. You're a winner and you're a conqueror and you have access to all power and victory in Jesus name. So I can boldly say, be strong, be courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. The Lord, your God will go with you wherever you go. There's nothing to fear. Thank you. I'll see you next time.